بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أنا الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا ما يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يتع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعض فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محتثاتها وكل محتثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار Two points before we begin today's principles that we're going to take inshallah in the Qawaid al-Fiqhiyya al-Kubra so that I don't forget really because I've been forgetting the last few classes there's a brother, reverb brother, his name is Suleiman. I think some of you may know him, but anyway, he was shot in his head a few days ago, and he's in Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth Hospital, in critical condition. So he is in need of the dua of you brothers, as well as those of you who would like to go to visit him. It would be a nice dawah method because his family are now Muslims. He has a sister, a wife who are Muslim, cousin who's Muslim. And by visiting the brother and giving them uh, support, giving him love, dua, doing ruqya, things like that, the uh, family has responded very well to that. So anybody who would like to go to visit that brother without making things difficult upon him, very short, quick visit in Queen Elizabeth Hospital. This class is not about the virtues of visiting people in the hospital or when they're sick, but it's a tremendous opportunity, Those, especially those of you who are fasting on Thursdays and or Mondays to fast, to visit someone, to give sadaqah, all of those things, they have virtues. The other thing is, I don't know all of the details as to what happened to the brother, but uh, from what I understood, other people were along with him when he was shot. One person was killed. The other one was wounded, but he was wounded critically, and so now he's in critical condition. So we just like to remind uh, ourselves, remind each other, about the importance of um, defusing those things that happen in the street as opposed to feeding into them and letting them get uh, bigger and they get out of hand. Because in most instances, people lose their lives over things that are not even worth it. So his life is in danger. Another person lost his life. The person who took his life, if he gets caught, his life is done. So we just would like to remind our Shabab of the false bravado and that um, with swast that shaitan makes, uh, it creates it between people and we wind up uh, hurting people or hurting ourselves. Most so of that stuff is not even um, worth it. Second of all, concerning this class, concerning this class, it's been announced that this class is about a sulu fiqh, a fiqh class and the situation is not like that. Al-amal that. When you learn about usul fiqh, usul fiqh is different from fiqh in that when you do a fiqh class, what you're going to learn is halal and haram. This water, you can use it to make wudu. There are three types of water. This is how you pray. This is how you make uh, a tayammum. And this is how you make wudu. And this is how you have to give zakat. And this is who should give zakat. And this is the ruling of al hajj and umrah. And this is how you perform hajj and umrah. This is the sunnah. And this is from the arkan and so forth and so on. That's fiqh. As for fiqh and studying in fiqh, it's not dealing with that. Fiqh is breaking down for the person, the student. If you learn in usul fiqh, it's breaking down the masadir of a tashri. It's breaking down those things that make things halal and haram. 
It's going to explain to you what the Quran is and how it makes things halal and haram. What the sunnah is, what type of sunnah, what type of hadith. Things like that. It's about the issues that make things halal and haram. It's about the commands of the Quran. Do they mean that the thing is wajib when Allah commands you? When Allah prohibits you from doing something, does it mean that that thing is haram? That's asul al-fiqh. It's dealing with those issues. What we're dealing with is just taking some of the principles of asul al-fiqh. The five major ones. And from those five major ones, other principles come out. But we're not going to deal with all of that. Because the goal and the objective of the class is not to get deep, deep into the issue of asul al-fiqh or these principles. Just give you an opportunity to scratch the surface to learn these principles, as I mentioned before, to help you to appreciate the depth of this science in Al Islam. But even more than that, to help you just to navigate based upon these basic issues in your everyday life. In your everyday life. Like the brother who is in the situation that he's in. Like what we talked about last week about the culture of the people. So when you go and you visit those people and you know that the culture has the ability to make something halal and haram, if you know that, when you go and visit, you'll know there are things you should do and there are things you shouldn't do. So this is what that class or this class is all about, the qawaid or some of the main rules in usul al-fiqh. So we come to one that we mentioned many times before and it's one of the most important ones, one that we have to realize, appreciate, keep it forefront of our minds, and that is the statement that the scholars came up, yuzal, that all harm should be alleviated and raised up. No one should be harmed. A few weeks ago, Saturdays ago, we gave a part of this talk, just from the hadith angle and point of view, but that, um, when we dealt with that issue, the best of the Muslims are the ones who the people are saved from the earth hands and from their tongues and we explained back then that this hadith it uh, brings forth and it proves one of the most important principles in asul al-fiqh in the deen of Allah and that is harm all harm should be raised up no one should be in the hospital shot in the head no one should shoot anybody with a gun in the head no one should have to visit someone who's been shot in the head by with a gun all of that you shouldn't harm people there shouldn't be any harm on the face of the earth. This principle comes from the Juwami al kalim the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that has far-reaching implications. His Juwami al kalim and the hadith that was collected by al Imam al Hakim on the authority of the companion Abu Sa'id al Khudri. May Allah be pleased with him. He said that the Prophet said. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam La darar wa la dirar Easy, simple hadith One of those hadith That it doesn't take a lot For a non-Arabic speaking Muslim To commit to him To memory Because he's going to always Have to use it It's going to always come up In his life La darar wa la dirar There should be no harm in And there should be no Reciprocating harm This is definitely From his juwami al kalim he said, I've been given five things. No other prophet was given those five things. No other prophet was given those five things. I've been made victorious by a month's journey. So when I go out after my enemy, as soon as they hear that I'm coming, they're going to be afraid of me and my companions. So I've been made victorious before I even get there. He said, the earth, number two, has been made a masjid and a purifier. This wasn't the case with the prophets and the messages before. So any man from my ummah, when it's time for him to pray, then let him pray. He doesn't have an excuse. There's no masjid around here. There's no water around here. You just make tayammum off of the ground and you pray wherever you happen to break, where you happen to be. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that the spoils of war, the spoils of war were made halal for his ummah, not halal for the other communities. Only his ummah can utilize what they received from al jihad fi sabi'ilat. He said, and I was sent to all of the people. Whereas the prophets before me, they were only sent to their particular specific people. And the last one, and this is the point, I was given the juwami al-kalim, the juwami al-kalim. His ability to articulate far surpassed what the other prophets and messengers had the ability to do. Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhim ajma'in. This is from his juwami al-kalim. Few words, 
long, far-reaching implications. La darar wa la dirar. There's a lot of explanation kalam from the scholars about this small sentence. But the easiest translation for us to understand is just that. Because the word that's being used here, that's being used here, is the same word being twice, being used twice. So it has to have a different meaning. The issue is, what is the exact meaning? Because it's from the Jawam and Kalim, people have different opinions. But the best opinion, inshallah, is the opinion and the definition. There should be no harm in people. You shouldn't harm anyone. And if you are harmed, you shouldn't reciprocate that harm. Taking things into your own hand and then escalating the problem by getting revenge that's unsupervised. So it comes from that hadith, this particular principle. Now, the proof of this principle is throughout the Quran. As we told you last week with the Ada. The Ada is the culture. And we told you that the Sheikh Al Imam Al Qurtabi showed that the word that is used in the Quran and the Sunnah for Ada is just that Ada, Urf, Ma'ruf. And we gave you those ayat that brought those words. And we brought to you those ahadith where those words were used to show culture. So the word here, la darar, a da, like dalim, and ra, is coming from that word. Wala dirar, the same word. So the Quran and the ahadith are going to bring the same word showing this thing is not permissible. And there are many, many ayat, like the ayat of at talaq. Allah Ta'ala mentioned to the men in the Quran in Surah at talaq using the, the word do not hurt these women that you have divorced. When you're going to divorce them or when you divorce them, you harm them in a way just to make things more difficult upon them. And that can be done in many ways. This is not the time to explain the ayah. But the word is used, do not hurt those women when you divorce them by saying, um... I'm going to, if you want to divorce, if you want to divorce, give me my children, for an example. He's not, he can't take care of those kids because of his lifestyle. But he wants to hurt them, so he threatens them with that. He doesn't feed them. The point is that the word is used here. There should be no hurting, nor should there be any reciprocating in the harm. And that's why Allah said to the women, similar in the issues of a divorce in Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah number 232, he said, La tudaru walidatum bi waladiha. No mother shall be hurt as a result of her baby. And the same word was used. And the reason why the ayat is being mentioned is it's talking about suckling the baby. That if there is a divorce, the father has the right that his child is allowed to suckle from his mother in the period when she's in her idda. So the woman can't turn around and to hurt the husband, she says, I'm not going to give your baby any of my milk. I'm going to put him on a regular milk. This is what this ayat is talking about, and this is what the ayat is preventing. The husband from hurting the lady, and the lady from hurting her husband, the lady from hurt, hurting her child, and so forth and so on. So the point here is, the word itself is being used, especially in those ayats of a divorce. وَلَا تُمْسِكُهُنَّ الدِّرَارًا لِتَعْتَدُوا do not hold on to your wives. You don't want her. You don't love her. There's nothing between you and her. You're staying married just to oppress her. So she's married, but she's like she's suspended in animation. So the word was used over and over and over again, and it proves there should be no harming and there should be no reciprocating harm. There are other general ayat, and there are many, many, many ayat, but we just gave you those ayat because the word is being used. But this concept that there should be no harm, there should be no harm in people in terms of their blood, in terms of their honor, in terms of their wealth, in terms of whatever the case may happen to be. And this is why Allah has, Ta'ala has commanded us to have ihsan, because the opposite of harm. He said in the Quran, for an example, وَلَا تُؤْتُوا سُفَهَا أَمْوَالَكُمْ أَلَّتِي جَعْلَ اللَّهُ فِيكُمْ قِيَامًا do not give the money to those people. Don't give your money 
to those people who are the sufaha, people who don't know the importance and the value of money. It's your money, your children, your women, your whoever happens to be. Don't give them your money because they are sufaha. These people are not aware of the value of money. As a result of that, they're going to hurt themselves. So the ayah said, don't give them your money. and Don't give them their money. If you've been put in charge of their money, don't give it to them. So it's a lot of ayat. As for the ahadith of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, fahadith wala haraj, from what has been reported to us from the incidents of the judgments of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, with the usage of this word, is what Imam Abu Dawood brought in other than him. One man, he owned some land. Another man had a tree that he planted on the other man's land. The tree belongs to him and the land belongs to someone else. The tree was bothering the owner of the land. It was causing some problems, some hurt, some pain. Some issue was there. He didn't want the man's tree there. It was a problem. So he went to the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he complained. The man has a tree and it's in my land and it's bothering me. I want the water to go down where the tree is and I can't because his tree is there. The prophet told the owner of the tree, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Either sell the tree to the man or donate the tree to the man because it's his property and your tree is on the property. The man said, I don't want to. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told the owner of the land, cut the tree down. Get rid of the tree. And he said to the one whose tree it was, Innama anta mudar. You are the one who's hurting someone. You're the one who's harming someone here. So the word, again, is used in this hadith so it supports the principle that all harm, all pain, all hurt should be raised up, should be eliminated, gotten out of the way. Again, many a hadith. He mentions sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam as we mention la darar wa la dirar wa man darra darrahu Allah wa man shaqa shaqa Allahu alayhi there should be no harm in, nor should there be reciprocating harm. And anyone who harms someone else, Allah is going to harm you. And anyone who is difficult, he makes things difficult and complicated on people, Allah is going to make things difficult and complicated upon you. Meaning he's going to uh, punish you for what you've done because it's not permissible to complicate the lives of the people. From this principle, Ikhwani, a lot of other important principles came. We don't want to deal with the last one because I don't think the branches of that issue could get a bit complicated. But this one is important because it's a lot of things that we deal with. From those principles that come under this umbrella is that when there is a dorora, a dorora means those things that have to happen. You have to have them in your life. They said that dorori, a dororat to be al mahdurat. From this principle, both scholars came up with this principle, which is when something is like haram, when something is um, not permissible, due to necessity, due to necessity, that thing becomes permissible because it's a necessity. Life or death. Something is haram. Is going to hurt you. But not having it or being in that situation is going to cause a person undue stress, real difficult, a real difficulty in his life. As a result of that, because El Islam came to make things easy on people and to take off of them toughness and roughness and undue stress, then the thing that is normally haram becomes permissible. And again, there are many delil from the Quran on that. And many from the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. From that is what happened with the family of Ammar, Yasir's family. Ammar, Yasir, Ibn Ammar, Ammar ibn Yasir. When the Kufaf Quraysh killed his mother and his father in front of him, and they forced him, they compelled him to speak bad about the Prophet ﷺ to speak bad about al-Islam. So the man spoke bad against the Nabi. He didn't feel that way. He was forced and compelled. His life was on the line. 
So it's not permissible for a person to speak negatively about Allah or his messenger. But if the individual is put in that situation, his life and death is what is allowed in order to save his life. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked the man when he came and told him the story, when that happened to you and they compelled you to say those things, how did you feel? He said, I love Allah and his messenger. I felt bad about it. I didn't like what I had to do. They made me do it. If it wasn't for that, I would have never done it. The Prophet told him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if they catch you again, then repeat the same thing. So again, this harm of what he said, this thing that is haram, it becomes permissible if the man's life is on the line. The ayats in the Quran about food. Allah has made it haram for us to eat blood, to eat dead animals, to eat swine, to eat the animals and the meat that's been slaughtered on the altars, to eat animals, the meat of animals that have been obtained through divination, to eat many issues, animals that have been gored to death, animals that have been eaten by other wild animals. And he mentioned a number of ayat like that. He said at the end of all of those ayats, whoever was compelled and he had to do it, then Allah is ghafur rahim. Then Allah is ghafur rahim. So again, necessity, necessity. When something is a necessity, then the thing that is normally haram, it becomes permissible. And this principle comes from what we are talking about today. It is a derivative, a branch of the first principle. And there are many delils from that, from the time of the Prophet wasallam. And from the Quran itself. We mentioned before there were some women in the times of Jahiliyyah, they used to force those women into prostitution, Akramakumullah. And they were slaves and they would have to do it. So when Allah made it haram, the believers stopped doing it. But the hypocrites who were not true believers, they continued to force the women to do prostitution. Because if the girl said no to her, Sayyid, her master, he would kill her. She's a slave. She has no one to protect her. No one to give her rights. So Allah Ta'ala mentioned, anyone who compels and forces his slave girl to do prostitution in the Quran, he mentioned that. And then they do it, Allah is ghafur rahim. So if a person has to save his life by drinking khamar, if a person has to save his life by drinking something that is from the najasat, eating something that's najasa, doing something that is haram, then this principle is the principle that uh, comes from this particular issue. And many other principles, but we're not going to get into all of those, as I mentioned, because some of them are more complicated and we won't come across them. We just want to deal with the famous ones that we hear all the time and the ones that we're going to use in our everyday lives. So an individual like you guys he wants to go to university and he has to get a, a loan. I'm going to tell him right off the bat, don't get a loan if you can help that. Borrow money from your relatives. Borrow money from people you know. Go to work and take a longer time to graduate if that's what you can do because it's better not to fall into riba. But... You're never going to go to the university in some cases if you don't go and get that loan. That loan is haram because of the riba that's involved. But because there's no other way for the individual and he exhausted all other avenues out of necessity, out of necessity, he goes and he does it. And he does the least amount of it, which is another principle that comes from this issue. And that is, when a person is forced and compelled into something that's a necessity, he only takes from it that which is enough to sustain him. He doesn't go beyond what is enough. So if he has to eat pork, for an example, in order to save his life, to get from this point to that point, he only eats enough pork, just enough, just to sustain his life. He doesn't eat all of the pork, all of the haram. He doesn't drink all of the thing that's haram. He just does enough of it to get by, to get by. He just does enough of it just to get by. The lady, she has to undress herself in the hospital in front of a male doctor, technician, a male nurse. She has to because there's some part of her body that needs to be checked. 
then that's the only part of the body that she uncovers. That's it. She doesn't have to uncover everything if it's not being, if it's not necessary. She just uncovers that portion of her body that needs to be exposed, be it the shoulder, the knee, whatever it happens to be. But she doesn't say, okay, I'm compelled. I'm in this situation. I'm in the hospital. And what most of the people do is that they take all their clothes off and they get checked. She's just going to take enough clothes off to expose the part of the body that is necessary. So from this issue, honey, there are many, many other principles that come. But I think the main principle right here that should be grasped, understood, and appreciated is the one that says we shouldn't harm people and we shouldn't reciprocate harm in any shape, form, or fashion. And as we mentioned, except with what the religion has allowed. The religion has allowed for there to be some reciprocity when it comes to an eye for an eye. The religion allowed for the laws of revenge or al qisas So you hit someone, you hurt someone, you in turn you have to pay the price for what you did. But that's because the religion allowed you to do that. But generally speaking, something that shouldn't be done. Okay, Akhwani, if you brothers have any questions and a lot of other issues come from this, maybe during the Q&A session, some of them will come out. Do you guys have any questions concerning this particular qaida? Fadi Abdul Qadir. Say it again. With a da, with a da, da lean, a da, with a da, with a da. Nah. Any more questions, Ikhwani? Yeah. About the tree. I can't really speak upon the situation that is detailed like that, but other principles come into play, as I mentioned. From these principles is that if you have these kinds of problems that are going on, then what we're going to do is we're going to look at the situation and there's something that's harmful that's taking place. The man has some property and the masjid is on the property. So do we knock the property down? Do we knock the masjid down so that he can have his property? The judge is going to look at that issue and he's going to say, we're going to take the thing that has the least amount, the least amount of hurt. You're going to take the least amount of the hurt. The harm, there's some harm there. We have to fall into one of the two. We're going to fall into the least amount of the harm. So getting rid of the masjid is a big harm on the community. If you break down the masjid, the people won't have a place to pray Juma. The people won't have a place to pray the Muslims five times a day. It's the man's property, no doubt about it. But where is the masjid? How big is the masjid? You've got to look at all of those issues. But from the principles that come from this is the individual, he has to fall into one of the two He's going, to f he's going to choose the one. He's going to choose the one that is the least of the two in terms of evil. So the judge is going to determine that. He will determine that. Any more questions, Ikhwani? Okay, then, inshallah, we'll stop here. Barakallahu feekum wa ahsanallahu alaykum. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyyina wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in. Who said mahdurat over here? Men. Akhuna? Shukran laka ya akhi. Akramakumullah. I thought it was you, Sharif, or Dawood. I didn't see tattoos on his hand, but he was a tall brother. Sister's a Muslim. Uh, has a cousin who's a Muslim, lives in Hansworth, I think, over there. 
I don't know, man. I, when I saw him on the bed, I, I, I kind of noticed him. I recognized him, but I don't really know him that well. Yeah, the shooting in Hansworth. He's darker than me. Tall brother. He needs out with Dua in the uh, Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Aleikou alayhi salam. Hey, Dr. Abu Hanifa, are you okay? Yeah, yeah, because I just came from a trip. I've been traveling all 